death by Gucci knockoff? If there's one thing that differentiates Queer Duck and Too Mad is that Queer Duck wasn't alone. <laughs> Queer Duck may have gotten the bonus of airing alongside Queer as Folk and getting its own feature length movie, Queer Duck is far from being the only LGBT oriented cartoon that existed in the 2000s. Despite the multiple websites that count down the top 20 LGBTQ cartoons and list only 2020 shows and shows that happen to have one gay character, there is another LGBTQ centered show that premiered on MTV and Logo, the gay and lesbian network channel in the 2000s, the brick film known as Rick and Steve, the happiest gay couple in the world. Rick and Steve revolves around the happiest gay couple in the world. Rick and Steve, I, I repeated the title, but that's what it is. After checking out the same guy's ass, the nerdy and intelligent Filipino Rick and the meat-headed monster truck loving Steve fall in love and live together loving life and hating girls. Created in 2006 up to 2007 by filmmaker Alan Braca, aka Q Alan Braca, the story of the happiest gay couple in the world is the one told through the world of cute blocks and dolls. Aside from Rick and the hemorrhoid we meet, the story also revolves around Dana and Kirsten, a lesbian couple preparing to be the best mothers they can to baby Dixie, who has telekinesis powers. Chuck, a disabled HIV positive who is not because HIV positive, but because he got hit by a car the same day he got his positive HIV diagnosis, and also he's a DILF and he sounds like Jubei, and now I'm questioning my main in Blaze Blue. Oh, Pepito, just let me smell you. Chuck's younger partner, Evan, a 19-year-old who on one hand loves Chuck and cares for him, but also wants that money from Chuck's will, apparently. You. And many other characters such as the alternative lifestyle companion Condi Lin, drag queen Felicia, trans man Dylan, the Asian fetishizing ex-boyfriend of Rick, Hunter, and several others. Now, w wait a second. Kamino, did you just say brick film? You you know what brick films are, right? Like, Lego stop motion animations? Uh, of course I do, yes. Well, you see, Rick and Steve didn't jump straight into the TV world, as it started out as a Lego brick film. In 1999, when Alan Braca was a student in Cal Arts, he was tasked with the homework of making a film about family. From here, Alan Braca combined his love for family sitcoms, his desire to see visibly queer characters engage in family, and his passion of making stop-motion Lego films to birth the first episode of Rick and Steve, all in Lego. After presenting it to his class and getting it at a local film festival, the film suddenly was seen by hundreds of film festivals. It was a hit, and Rick and Steve hit the ground running. Now, this is important for the time. Not only were we seeing brick films come forward and show their legitimacy and art, but we're also seeing LGBTQ filmmakers breaking through and showing their creativeness, especially at a time where not a lot of LGBTQ filmmakers were making their own work and presenting their own art and their perspective. Rick and Steve's creation was made on the idea of wanting to see more openly queer sitcoms, more visible gay and lesbian couples on TV. These Lego shorts were a statement of not only queerness on TV, but my shorts at the moment. We're here, we're queer, and we're bricked up. We're here to showcase ourselves authentically and visible as possible. It was great not only for queer people out there, but for Alan Braca himself, who actually has a few words to say about the creation of Rick and Steve. The assignment was to make a short film about relationships. And so where my head went right away was uh, just sitcoms. I really enjoyed the, those types of shows, um, but there was never one about queer families. Uh, this was in 1999 when I made this short film. <laughs> so uh, at the time, the only thing on TV with a queer character was Will and Grace. And whenever we did get characters, they were very rare, but they never had families. They never even had a relationship. Like maybe if we're lucky, they dated and didn't kiss on screen. But I was like, you know, we have family. So uh, that's kind of where the whole idea came from. A gay couple and lesbian couple who decide to co-parent which was happening quite a bit in the late 90s with zero kind of um, government help. Like you'd have to do all these extra documents because there was no, like marriage, like marriage wasn't even legal in one state yet. Um, not even a country yet. I think, I think, uh, oh, actually, no, I, I think the Netherlands came around just right around then. Um, 2001. So, huh? 2000, oh, so not even yep. the same yeah, year. So it was like, that's how foreign a concept it was at the time. I love animation and I love stop motion animation. And as a kid, I didn't really have any friends. So I made uh, a lot, did a lot of stop motion animation on my own with Legos. Uh, so then when I got to film school and had this assignment to make this short film, I knew that I picked CalArts because I wanted to learn a bit more about animation. 
Um, and I thought, you know, I don't have any friends. I'm in that boat again. I'm just going to make a stop motion short film out of Legos. And I ended up making this eight minute short um, that wasn't meant to do anything else besides just be a, a homework assignment. But um, a friend of mine at school saw it and was a volunteer at a film festival here in Los Angeles called Outfest and said, hey, you should show this at our festival. So I said, sure, um, yeah, let's do that. I expected it to be at a high school gym or something. I was like, a gay festival, probably not gonna be a huge attendance, but it was at the Directors Guild of America. Uh, it was a giant audience. We won the audience award at this screening. And that's where the programmer, the Sundance programmers approached me about submitting to their festival. Then uh, the film officially premiered at Sundance in 2000. Um, and then from there it took uh, a few years, an MTV bought option and developed it took a few years before it got turned into the series that you're familiar with. Considering this was a gay show in the 2000s, controversy and moral panic was certainly behind it. As Rick and Steve continued past its simple first episode and more film festivals picked it up, people both in and out the LEGO community were not reacting too well to the LA air. If you were to look up its history, you would see that the LEGO group was not too happy about gay people being seen on LEGO, as many cease and desist letters were sent to him. The LEGO cease and desist was a bummer, but honestly, I didn't fully, I, I kind of expected something like that to happen, because I'm like, you know, I'm so gay, and so there's so much going on here that I can see why this would be targeted. Other people were making brick films and putting them out on the internet. I was not aware of other people getting those same kind of letters, right? Uh, so it's, it did feel a bit targeted because of our content, but I have used to being discriminated against sadly. And um, my goal was to, was really more about what this story is and who, who these families are and just kind of entertaining us. While the Brick films were very explicit and did not hold anything back, to say that it was mostly targeted because of its open queerness wouldn't be a lie, as it was very common in the 2000s. However, it was used more for comedic effect and shock value. After all, Alan Brocka didn't just come out and say, I write porn! I'ma be honest, at least Rick and Steve lived, unlike Laddie, or got melted completely. I don't want to go out like him. People think I'm a failed toy line, but this guy? Next level. At least the budget was saved. The backlash didn't stop from the LEGO company or the media itself, as LEGO communities online were also upset at its existence, with archives showing how BrickFilm.com argued on whether or not Rick and Steve should be banned from the site. While there are no archives on the verdict, other screen caps show that the four original episodes were rare in the public eye and had to be treated online, privately. Despite this, Alan Bracco wasn't deterred, as the positive outweighed the negative, as while LEGO wasn't too happy, MTV and LOGO were more than happy to welcome Alan Bracco, and thus giving birth to the Rick and Steve we now know today. So it was a very long process um, to, to get the first episode up. Um, you know, it's months of animating. We had 16 stop motion stages running all at the same time. Um, it took, we, each one would get about eight seconds in one day, and that was the average. So it took quite a bit of time to, to animate all of these episodes. We would have um, between one and three episodes being animated simultaneously across these 16 stages. While we're doing that, I'm also storyboarding future episodes, writing, and then doing voice recording with the actors in LA. We animated the show up in Toronto at a studio called Cup of Coffee. Cup of Coffee studio. On July 10th, 2007, Rick and Steve, the happiest gay couple, debuted its first episode, which revolves around the main plot point of the show, a gay couple and a lesbian couple deciding to start a family and raise a baby. The first few episodes are pretty identical to the first four episodes of the Brick film, as they follow Dana and Kirsten struggling to get pregnant until a sudden car stop, Evan's supposed queer bashing in straight West Lahunga, aka the, the straight part of West Lahunga, I forgot the name, and Rick and Steve's eternal search for a threesome. And like its Brick film counterparts, is a story that continues through its episodes and dives deep into intimate family relationships, the raunchiness of West Lahunga, and of course the visibly queer and open sex of LGBTQ lives. Now, without Lego breathing down their necks, Rick and Steve were more free to explore other parts of queerness and bring them more into mainstream light. The network didn't have too much guidance or say these things had to happen. Um, they would occasionally say these things can't happen. Uh, I, I don't remember specifically, but they would let me like explore that and write it and then say, okay, that doesn't that's, that doesn't work or no one's gonna get that or, or whatever. Um, but 
they let me explore and it was it was pretty unprecedented honestly and now that i'm much older i i appreciate i i i think at the time i didn't appreciate how much freedom i have now um, very, you know, it's kind of unheard of. As the series progressed, we saw stuff such as gay cruises, the anxiety of not being a proper parent, maintaining a queer relationship, lesbian deathbed, drag queens and trans characters, the mandatory Wizard of Oz homage, and if you don't know why, watch this video, please, with the awesome queen Sally Pride drag. There's already one of those. It's called Wicked, and it's gayer than the original. The alternative lifestyle companions living in gayborhoods and the controversy of blending in with straights. Magic the Gathering reference. Magic the Gathering reference. God sent. I feel seen by this gay nerd. I love him so much. Thank you. And becoming a niche micro internet celebrity on video sharing sites because you shove the camera inside your friend's vagina while she's going into labor and flash the baby in the womb, which may or may not hit too hard on my psyche. I'm going to move out of this conversation because I'm really uncomfortable to even going to San Francisco and realizing that there's no proper way to represent queer people and you're not too gay or too straight Time! i want everyone to bookmark this part of the video until we get back to the next video please bookmark this video this will come back in a future video literally the next video after this okay bye on the topic of the san francisco episode here's the thing about lgbtq representation a lot of it is expected to be squeaky clean and showing only good behavior happy humor of gays being what not cheery exactly what you want them to be what you don't want them to be is shunned and pushed to the side rick and steve does not do that at all i mean for proof if you look up rick and steve on youtube you'll see the first scene is the threesome scene where rick and steve are a bit weird towards a trans man porn star with a snap on go even further and you see steve shouting sexist and lesbophobic insults towards dana and dana being homophobic towards steve back we also get several interactions such as how gay people are actually taken over to rule the world how many people keep bigoted people around just so they can feel good about their bigotedness to also how gay men are the most bigoted of the lgbt community to how straight acting gay people are shunned from san francisco's freaky bob gay community hold on i'm getting a phone call and other stuff that would make gay people and straight people turn their head back you would think this comes from shows like South Park or Family Guy, and you'd be wrong, but kind of right. That's what Alan Bracco was aiming for, attempting to capture the edgier and more blunt humor of shows at the time, but put a queer spin on it. And it works. Honestly, the offensive slash edgy jokes in Rick and Steve are welcome, as they come less from a point of being edgy or offensive to attack minorities, but more from a friendlier perspective. It's queer people making fun of other queer people, while also laughing at themselves. It's jokes that come from authentic love from the queer community, not to punch down or laugh at queer people's struggles, and I feel like that's what differentiates Rick and Steve from other adult cartoons. It had its own background and its own community that it was focused on, and it works. Other examples can be more oral and the Christian community or the PJs in the black community. Rick and Steve was that but for the LGBT community and such these jokes work. The jokes as well as the plot of the baby having telekinesis and also the silly ideas of gays controlling the world yada 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 is something you'd never expect from an LGBTQ show. But Rick and Steve's existence is kind of expecting that because Rick and Steve as a show usurps expectations and breaks out of what's restricted by not only queer people but by stop motion animation and shows completely and after interviewing Alan Braca himself that's when I realized there's such a clean plastic look to Legos and this nuclear family and all of the skin tones were like white um, and I was like I'm going to make this family that rep that's about people I know tr trying to be f uh, being kind of fit into the system that, that Legos created. And I thought that was part of the comedy of it is how we don't fit into a system uh, yet. Yet uh, here here's this toy that only fits into the systems. And what happens when um, people that don't fit try to make a family there? Rick and Steve is inherently ironic in its existence as it's a non-binary idea and a binary presentation. Being limited to stop motion, Rick and Steve was able to play around with its animation and its character looks. Not to mention the stigma of stop motion was simply limited to kids entertainment. Rick and Steve was its own thing. It was humorous and silly for adult audiences while also having dramatic fight scenes, more sillier moments you wouldn't necessarily see on other stop motion films or brick films at the time. More importantly, it was openly gay, as gay-centered cartoons were rare and not explored with the exception of Queer Duck. Check this video out, I made it. And that's something I'll always appreciate Rick and Steve for. 
Rick and Steve really wanted to tell its own story, however it was limited not only by its ideas of stop motion animation, but also because LGBTQ content is kind of shoved under the rug unless it's for either the episode where they have to address it or just completely laugh at it. Rick and Steve holds nothing back and it tries to be as authentic as it is, not to mention it benefited from being on Logo because Logo was able to allow it to be as queer as possible without any limitations or any brand ruining. I personally would have loved an episode where Steve would confront his homophobic mom and say, We have made the LGBT community happy. I made my husband Rick happy. Same sex marriage is now legal across the whole West Lahunga Beach. <laughs> okay. Not to mention, Rick and Steve kind of moved away from cliche plot points and or other factors that happen when you bring up the gay community. It was really about having fun, and what it did tell the story was very interesting. However, like all good things, it must come to an end. Unfortunately, the 2008 recession, according to Braca, was the reason the show was cancelled, leaving the cliffhanger of who the father was up in the air. Until now. For two seasons on Logo, it was an impressive run. While Logo unfortunately decided to opt all in on reality TV, abandoning its scripted shows, the latter did leave its mark and aren't forgettable. And that rings true for the happiest gay couple in the world. Rick and Steve as a show is fun, but weird. Especially weird, but also really, really fun. It never conforms to expectations and always makes the best of its characters. For every lesbian joke, there's always a scene of Kirsten worrying not only about caring for her loved ones, but also wanting to strengthen the relationship with Dana to prevent lesbian be lesbian deathbed. I, I don't know, I'm not a lesbian. I love y'all lesbians, though. For every Evren joke, there's always a heartfelt scene with him and Chuck bonding and being a cute couple. And as a Dilf hunter, I salute Evan. I wonder what shampoo Chuck uses. And for every joke that can be seen as edgy, offensive, or rude, there's always scenes of Rick and Dana exploring their Filipino and Jewish heritage openly, Steve confronting his homophobic religious mom, and just expressions of authentic queerness. If you can, do check out Rick and Steve and watch it for what it is, an authentic queer stop motion show with its heritage in Lego brick films and built on being a homage to LGBTQ identities and sitcoms in the 2000s. I cannot thank History Shaker 7412 enough for commenting this on my Queer Duck video and introducing me to this show, and it's amazing. And History Shaker 7412, you are part of the reason this video is airing today, now, September 2nd, 2024. It's an important day today. Why? Because it's Q Alan Braga's birthday. So make sure to wish him a happy birthday and thank him for making an amazing TV show as well as checking out his other projects such as Eating Out and other films that I'll link in the description below. However, like how I share a birthday with Ren Goatku and twice, Alan Braca shares a birthday with someone very JJK season 2 opening 2 to this channel and me personally. He's someone I considered the Deadpool to my Wolverine. If our personality switched. If you've never read the descriptions of my videos, you're new to my videos, or you just forgot, you might wonder who the guy who voices Shadow is, and it's none other than one of the most talented VAs and brick filmers I know, Airborne. Airborne Productions is the channel you want to go to for LEGO films and excellent voice acting. He's been my go-to if I need voices, and also just to gush about Sonic stuff, wink aggressively, Husk from Hasbro Hotel, even though he doesn't admit it, and laughing at Adam Sandler movies. While I originally wanted to shout him out in my Final Space video, I've been told by him multiple times, I will not watch your damn cat show. But this is better. This is a brick film adjacent show for people who are bricked up like us. And like Alan Braca, he's a talented filmmaker that I'll always love being around and love working in. So make sure to check out his Green Lantern films and wish him a beautiful happy birthday today. Because Alan Braca did too. They're birthday twins after all. Hey Airborne, September 2nd is an incredibly amazing day uh, for being born. I know because that's when I was born on September 2nd as well. So happy birthday Hot to twist. both of us. I'm so excited to know that there's a fellow Brick film creator who was born on the same day. Uh, I, I can't wait to see your work. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for watching mine. Nice to meet you and happy birthday. Thank you. And you do not have a gun to your head. I did not force you to do this. <laughs> I do not have a gun to my head. I'm only doing this because we have the same birthday. I would not do this for just anybody. Airborne, if you're still watching this, you're amazing and I love you. Every time we hang out on VC, talk about our lives, gushing about Sonic leaks or the new movie coming out or how Junkie XL is kind of a fraud, I get as bricked up, as bricked up 
as the Lego brick film that started the Logo TV show. The Logo TV show that depicts the happiest gay couple in the world, Rick and Steve. Seriously, go subscribe to him now. I am tired of these absolutely vile rumors that I got Bluetooth killed. Let's look at the tape. In the Lego bin? You're either food for a mock or you work for her. And I'll tell you who she is. Joanna, a megalomaniacal psychotic asshole. A finger licking dead inside pixie slab of third rate dim store nut milk. And I'll tell you what she can do. I'm listening. She can lick my goddamn cinnamon ring clean and kick rocks all the way to bald hell. In fact, I don't give a shit. If she removes all of my skin and pops me like some nightmarish blood balloon, if the last thing I do in this godforsaken cum gutter existence is light the fuck box on fire, I still won't die happy! Shit, girl, you crazy! That's right, Common! I won't be happy until I've urinated on her freshly barbecued corpse and husk fucked the chai remains while gargling juggernauts juggernauts! Wow! And you could quote me on that! Kay! I'm M. Nick Bluetooth from Galador! <laughs> gotcha, fuckface.